Good morning! Here we go with lesson three. So, uh, chapter 16, section three, mining regulations and mine reclamation. So we'll kind of wrap up this chapter with the notes and we'll go from there. Uh, the essential question, in what ways does mining affect the environment? We kind of looked at minerals, mineral ore, what are some of the things we go after and why we go after them, uh, how we need to go about it, whether it's uh, subsurface, surface mining, strip mining, etc. And we're going to look at the regulations, kind of where the rubber meets the road on controlling this and what it actually does to the environment, which unfortunately can be quite a lot. So impacts of mining. Uh, once again, it's one of the most heavily regulated industries in the United States right now because it can cause so much damage. So there's a lot of fines, laws, regulating what a mine can do, can't do, and what they have to do after the fact. So they wind up spending a lot of money to preserve the environment. They're going to go in and obviously disrupt it, and to a degree we accept that because we need the copper, we need the ore, we need the gold, we need whatever it is, titanium, but when it's all said and done, we need to make up for it, turn the environment back into what it was. Uh, reclaiming the mine, once again, I hope you've done the cookie mine and realize how difficult it was to reclaim, to turn that cookie back into a cookie after you stripped all the chocolate chips out. Granted, it's no longer a chocolate chip cookie, but it can still be a cookie. So the area, it's no longer a place where there was gold. We take the gold out, but can we leave the area something like what it used to be? Coal has had such a bad aspect of strip mining and ruining an environment that reclaiming the land is part of every surface mining operation. Something they have to take into account. How much coal is there? What is it gonna to cost to get it out? What is it going to cost to turn it back into uh, an environment that's acceptable? If you take a look at the next picture, this is a strip mining affair up in the Appalachians after it's been put back. So uh, if you're kind of doing it under a slideshow presentation, fail. It doesn't really look like it did beforehand. Well, we also have air and noise pollution. We looked at noise pollution before with our decibel meter. We know anything getting over like 120 decibels is something that can cause problems. Uh, well, mining are using a lot of machinery going on, explosives blasting out the land, the trucks running back and forth. So noise gets created by all of this. Um, and just while noise can be a nuisance, the blasting can actually cause hearing problems and danger. So theoretically, they're supposed to control that. Also, dust. We get a lot of coal dust when we're doing it. That can cause black lung in our miner guy back here under the lung, but it causes problems for people. When we're strip mining and it's at the surface, the dust is flying everywhere. So it can affect anybody. These things have to get controlled. So, the regulations forbid mining at, uh, operations to allow dust or noise to exit the area. So they claim a large area to be the mine, even though they're only mining right here. This whole area is the mine. But once again, coal dust can travel miles. Sound, although it does dissipate with um, space because its um, intensity gets down as it spreads out, they can keep the uh, noise pollution to a level that's acceptable, but the dust is another thing. If you kind of look at the picture I have back behind here, we're looking at a strip mining operation, and you can see the dust leaving the mine. It then gets carried off and can cause problems for asthmatics, etc., anywhere downwind of the mine. Once again, kind of another fail. Water contamination is another one. In our virtual lab, we're going to look at copper sulfate and removing uh, the copper from the copper sulfate. Well, we get the copper sulfate by dissolving the copper out into a solution, pumping the solution out, then reclaiming the copper somewhere else. If that winds up leaking out of the mine into the water sources, 
it can harm or kill aquatic life, obviously. When uh, coal has high amounts of sulfur in it, so you have pure coal, but there'll be sulfur impurities in the coal itself. Once again, we don't always find these things completely pure, and sulfur is a part of the coal that likes to burn, so it's part of it. But the sulfur reacts with oxygen and water to create, ta-da, sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid will dissolve various toxic minerals and etc., and can actually dissolve rock. We've seen that with the acid rain. Sulfuric acid, especially with limestone, can dissolve it out. And in some cases, this can leak out the back of a mine, get into water supplies, and cause lots of problems. So, if they are disposing of this acid-producing rock, once again, they've dumped acid, they're hauling the rock out, well, there's still acid left on the rocks. If you dump it in a heat, and then it rains on it, that acid washes out away. So, they have to uh, store this rock or do something with it to keep it from contaminating the area. If you take a look at the next slide, well, we can see on the left-hand side of the picture, this is coming down from a mine where they're using chemicals and etc. If you look closely at the color of the rocks on one side, they're one color, kind of a yellowish orange, and on the other side, they're kind of a normal gray-black because as the water runs over it, it taints it, and this just dumps into the clear river, it washes out. It's a problem. Once again, another fail. And wildlife gets displaced. Obviously, you're stripping all the soil and the rock and the dirt off where there aren't any trees. Things are going to leave. Even things in the soil get disrupted, like our friend the naked mole rat. He has nowhere to live. Um, so they're going to take all this place out. They need to try and show in some shape, form, or fashion this is going to be temporary. Once again, the environment should look like it did before or even better when the mine is done. Of course, it might be decades before a mine finishes up, but we want to try and say, hey, are you going to restore it so that the wildlife can come back? Dredging, you're stirring up the river, you're digging up all this muck and dumping it. Well, it destroys the aquatic life. All the little bugs, helgramites, etc., that dig down the larval stage in there. Well, they get disrupted and upside down, and now we don't have part of the ecosystem for that river. Any one part of the ecosystem takes a nosedive. Everything else can as well because of food chains, food webs. It's just a disruption. We want to make sure it's going to be minimal. Once again, not always happen because once you begin dredging a river for 10 kilometers for you and me in america that's 6.2 miles of the river is going to be contaminated by the sediments muddy water mucky water and everything getting disrupted six miles of river is an awful lot of wildlife space and then we get just plain old erosion and sedimentation um, the rocks that we pull out. So we're pulling all these rocks so we can get to the copper. Well, what do we do with them? We tend to just dump them off to the side somewhere. So we have these large rock piles just called dumps. Well, then it rains or water runs across those and whatever was in there or down in the mine washes off, makes its way into the nearby stream. And it can be chemicals involved and it can just be dirt and sediment causing damaging the water quality. It's not what that stream used to be causing disruption to the wildlife. Next stream shows one where we're doing the streaming. You see the barrier wall supposed to be protecting it from the river there. Well, once again, that's the reclamation area and yeah, it's a fail. It's not really so good. And we get to just soil degradation. Remember in the strip mining process, we take the dirt off and we put it over here. Then we pull away the Overburg, just the big rock, and we set it here. We dig out all the coal, we take the coal, haul it away. Now we push back the rock and we push back the dirt. Well, these layers aren't always going to be the same way they were. We can't go put it back together like a jigsaw. The rock's just getting dumped in and the soil's getting dumped on top of that. Well, remember, it's the topsoil that's the good stuff for growing things. And we push all the soil back. It's not really going to be nice layers of topsoil, then the leaching area, and understory and bedrock. 
it all gets jumbled and mixed up. So any kind of uh, the layers richest in nutrients should be at the top, and now the whole thing's just kind of an eh, or so-so at best. Uh, look at the next picture, yeah, it's our soil flipped completely upside down. Hopefully the bedrock is at the bottom, but the leaching zone, the topsoil, subsoil, that stuff is just all mixed in there together, and it can take decades, thousands of years for the world to naturally create a nice level of topsoil again. So we either have to go in and add it ourselves for extreme cost or call it even. Once again, the mines are mainly about making money, turning a profit, and it's not always uh, left exactly like it should be. And then we get to subsidence. Remember our room and pillar. Oh, I took away my little demo. Look at the little pillows, the pillars, the styrofoam sitting on top where we could go in and dig. When we're done, we pull out those pillars so the mine will literally cave in because we don't want to leave an open mine for you guys to find. Go down there, explore, and get trapped in and caved on on top of you. So they tend to just let the roof fail. Well, we don't know the location of all the abandoned mines out there. Back with the old Miner 49er, these guys, they didn't want people to know where the mines were. They kind of kept them hidden a lot of times. And they go underground and dig around and have their veins. When they were done, they just left. This was before the 70s and the EPA. This was back in 1850, 1860s, 1900, early. A lot of those mines are still there. And then when they cave in, it creates problems. We go by now and we're expanding. We start to build houses and all of a sudden a house caves in, falls down into an old mine shaft. Not so good. But today we try and cave them in before we leave, but once again, creates problems itself. Look at the next slide. You got the cows out there in their pasture and all those holes, mines underneath it. Uh, it creates a big problem. So it turns something that could have been good cropland now at best into rangeland, only some animals can go out and graze on it. The land's not really usable for much more. So yeah, lose a pillar, yeah, one or two. And then we have underground mine fires. This is an aspect too. Well, we're digging underground, we're digging for things like coal, sulfur. Both of these are highly flammable. We're digging down for oil, uh, natural gas, lots of stuff we're digging underground for is flammable, but especially the coal, uh, coal and sulfur. Um, if these things catch fire for whatever reason, you're underground, it begins to burn, well, there's nothing to put it out with. We're not down there. So forest fires can cause it to get to it. Just a burning trash can can start a fire in a coal seam. You have a whole wall of coal underground. Well, now we've dug a shaft down, we've opened it up, and there's oxygen. Before, it wasn't a problem because it was all buried under dirt. No oxygen, no fire. Now we dug a hole, oxygen's in there, it catches fire for whatever reason. Forest fire, somebody throws out a cigarette, carelessness, you name it. Um, it's exposed to oxygen, it begins to burn. These fires are really hard to put out. We can't get down. There's multiple shafts, air gets in, and sometimes we simply have to let them burn themselves out. We can try and cave things in, but as we do, the fire opens up other holes, and they've been known to burn for decades, even centuries. We have a famous one or two that have been burning for over 100 years. They burn their way to the surface areas, they go through, release gas, smoke, causes lots of problems for anybody living nearby. Take a look at the picture there. This is one in China with a guy looking down in the hole and you click and oh no! Well, okay, actually Satan himself doesn't come out of these holes, but it does kind of look like hell on earth with the ground underneath on fire and boiling out. But it's just coal or sulfur deposits. So we get to our regulations. All mines have to comply with the Clean Water Act Safe Drinking Water Act. They can't do anything to endanger our waterways or our drinking water, aquifers, etc. 
they have to comply with the Endangered Species Act. They can't go completely disrupt the uh, ecosystem in an area where we have endangered animals and their habitat. So they have to look at all these things, uh, appeal to them, apply for the permits, show how they're not going to cause problems to any of this, and if they do, pay hefty fines for it. And at the very end, they must reclaim the area, reclaim the space. Theoretically, you take this nice mountain, but we're going to knock the top off, take out the coal. It should be a mountain when we leave it again. The Surface Mining Control Reclamation Act of 1977 uh, said this has to be on all public and private lands. Uh, they established a fund that is used to reclaim it. Because the problem is some of these companies go bankrupt. They didn't have as much coal as they thought, or prices went up, or prices went down. Uh, other regulations come on and they go bankrupt. So they can't afford to do the reclamation. So some uh, the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act set some money aside in fines that they, in order to try and fix this and take care of it. You can take a look at the next picture there. That is the Berkeley pit where we have the failings and et cetera, right near the town itself. So you kind of have the old mining area, but it is right beside the town that grew up next to it. So they got to get permits from the environmental agencies before they can begin fining. They have to apply for state and federal licenses in most of the cases and then agencies issue violations. Somebody comes by and looks. Are they doing what they're supposed to do? Has to have a oversight committee where there are fines if they actually are not complying. So our last slide there is showing a diamond mine in Russia. To try and give that a perspective, that is a city on the side of it built up around it. And that spiral going down the hole is like a two to three lane highway. So the big trucks can drive all the way down in it. That mine has now since been abandoned, but that uh, diamond mine right there pretty much funded Russia through much of the uh, Cold War. Um, anyway, lots of profit to be had in mining, lots of minerals that we need or just want, but we have to think about the environment and take care of business as it is. Anyway, that wraps it up for Chapter 3. Finish up either your set of notes, an outline of it, take care of your lab cover page and vocab, post it to me when you get the chance, and we'll talk to you guys later.